we're finishing the account of Noah. Today we are after the flood. A couple of things to add. Uh, this is uh, brought to me by uh, uh, Clark. Uh, it uh, is a cubit. A cubit's a measurement from your elbow to the tip of your hand. So when the dimensions for the ark were given, they were given in cubits. Now, that means, of course, it ra radically varies depending upon how long your arms are. You know, some of you folks out there are like uh, monkey arms. You're like this, that's a bigger boat. Some of you might have Tyrannosaurus Rex arms, and that's a littler boat. And then also, we have, I'm sure, a number of guests, but we have Debbie visiting from Maryland, who is the sister-in-law, no, yes, daughter-in-law of uh, uh, Miss Carolyn and Dr. Hank. And so uh, we're delighted to have her here. Uh, I don't know if she makes little Debbie cakes or not, but you may want to talk to her because they would be pretty good. We're going to do three things this morning, and I have an incredible number of slides. I got carried away. I generally do somewhere around 50 slides because it takes about a minute per slide on average. I have 104 slides. So, uh, all right, well, just fasten your seatbelt, put up your tray tables because we are taking off, okay? Um, we're going to talk first about a sad and disturbing story the highs and the lows after the flood. Then we're going to transition to the Tower of Babel and give a careful consideration to some of the key parts of that storyline. It's one of my favorite things to teach on in the Bible. So I'm hoping, if, if look, if we pull into the Tower of Babel section of this and we're not going to have time to do it right, I'm going to do the Dr. Hank thing and roll it into next week. But I'd like to get through it. I've got, we've got two more Sundays after today. The last Sunday we have will be kind of Christmas oriented. So I got this Sunday uh, and, and another Sunday to really teach this material. Then next January, we're starting with the book of Revelation. So um, uh, we will have done the 11 chapters of Genesis that are uh, uh, kind of in a, nut, uh, in a, in a group of themselves pre-Abraham. We'll get into a little of Abraham next week, hopefully. But before we finish today, of course, we need some ideas to take home because we've got to be really careful or this stuff becomes just intellectual and not also practical. And God never gave us scripture simply to engage our minds. He gave us scripture to engage our lives. So let's start with the sad and disturbing story. Put us into context of the storyline. We all remember Noah and the flood. This is the story where now he has parked the ark on Mount Ararat. And I don't know how many of y'all have been to Mount Ararat, but they've got a really interesting sign showing uh, how to park your... I had to draw some attention to it. I worked hard on that little slide. Uh, that really is, by the way, Mount Ararat, if anybody's wondering. Um, uh, anyway... The ark is parked, and we've got some highs, and we've got some lows. Let's start with the highs. The highs begin, Genesis 8, 14 through 15. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you so God further said and, and as I'm reading this I want you to be thinking about the Genesis creation story because a lot of that storyline is being echoed here but with some little tweaks bring out with you every living thing that's with you of all flesh birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps those are the things God made in the creation story birds and animals only thing left out is fish because you got to figure the flood didn't kill all the fish. They kind of thrive in a flood. Birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. God had said be fruitful and multiply and everything did after its kind. Again the language of creation being echoed here as the world's been recreated out of uh, uh, an, an 
big bath that it took. The no, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This is one of these passages that helps you understand why we call Genesis the prequel to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Because God doesn't tell his people and decide what is clean and unclean for Israel until that time on Sinai. That's when they get the list of kosher foods and kosher sacrifices. So this is one that's telling you this is written so that the Israelites will understand what they're talking about. But it's not saying that they already had the law of Moses because they didn't. I'll do more on that in a moment, but as we're just working through this. Took some of every clean animal, some of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And God blessed Noah, and God blessed his sons. That's going to be important in a little bit, so hang on to that. God blessed Noah, and God blessed his sons. Uh, um, yes. And said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth again what they had been told to do in creation they're told again now where they're told the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth upon every bird of the heavens upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are delivered when God created Adam and Eve, he set them in dominion over the animals and birds and fish and creepy crawlies. Now, with this restored world, he's done that with, in a sense, done that with Noah and his sons and, and their wives. The fear of you shall be with ev upon every beast. Every moving thing that lives will be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, now I give you everything. The indication being that vegetarianism was kind of the, the normal beforehand, but now animals are given to eat. That may be reading a little much into the text, but probably not. It does, if that is a fair rendering of the text, it does make it interesting when you go back to the Cain and Abel story. That Abel is raising the vegetables, Cain is raising the livestock. Now maybe that's for clothing, maybe that's for in milk, maybe that's for any number of things, but it's interesting. Um, you shall not eat flesh, this has got a but in front of it, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood, basically you can't tear the limb, you know, don't take the drumstick off of the chicken while the chicken's alive. You got to kill the chicken, you got to drain the blood, then you can eat the drumstick, okay? Same is true with uh, the rump roast on, on your cow. Okay, Don't go slicing that rump while the cow's still alive. You got to bleed it first, okay? Now, if you were following Jewish rabbinical readings, especially in the era from, let's say, 200 years after Jesus through medieval times, you would find some interesting material on this. And I want to insert it, A, because it's instructive, but B, I just want us to see how different minds at a different time in history read and understand these texts because one of the things we've really got to struggle to do is to go back three or four thousand years to try and understand this material go back many many cultures many many languages to try to grasp it and understand it today if we naively read this thinking like 21st century Texans or anybody else for that matter, we're going to miss so much that we ought to be getting if we read it and try to understand it in those older times. So medieval Jews would have told you, or rabbis, 
that there were 613 mitzvot. Mitzvot is the plural form of a mitzvah. Mitzvot are divine commandments. The law could be divided up into 613 things you had to do. They said, but Adam, before the law came, Adam only had six. Noah got a seventh. So here were the six that supposedly Adam had. Number one, no idolatry. Number two, no blasphemy. Number three, no murder. Number four, no sexual immorality. Number five, no stealing. Number six, be, have just courts. Establish a just court system. This passage is used by some of those medieval rabbis to teach that Noah got a seventh one and the seventh one was a food law. You can't eat parts of an animal that's not dead before you get it. You can't tear the limb or the flesh off of an animal that's alive and eat it. Now one of the most famous, if not the most famous, Jewish rabbi in the Middle Ages was Maimonides. And Maimonides said that if Gentiles, that's a lot of us in here, if Gentiles will follow these seven Noahic, uh, uh, Noahide laws, laws of Noah, then they will have a share in the world to come. Now, just interesting way to read this text. 9.5, for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. Forget the animals for a moment, let's talk people. From every beast I'll require it, and from man, from his fellow man, I'll require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall his blood be shed, for God made humans in his own image. People have the dignity, and I'll say the responsibility, of being image bearers of God. So we should carry into our lives the presence of God for other people to see. If you are a follower of God, God says, I've made you to be the walking billboard for me. Um, I, I, I'm not a, a lawyer who advertises, um, but... Uh, some lawyers are real um, good at that. Uh, maybe it's the right way to say it. And um, I, I saw, I was in, in Florida, and I saw this bus going by. It's just like a public bus. And the whole side of it was, you know, if you get in a wreck, call this lawyer. 1-800-HOPE-YOU'RE-HURT or something. I don't know. <laughs> And I, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, wow, now that's an advertisement. <laughs> Never heard of the lawyer, but it's an advertisement. Now, I just want to say that all of us are walking advertisements for God. And we ought to think about that. It ought to affect the way we treat people. It ought to affect the way we tip at a restaurant. I'm a follower of God. Have a blessed day. I prayed for you instead of leaving you a tip. Don't write that on the receipt. <laughs> this is a big deal. So be fruitful and multiply. That's on the heels of you're made in the image of God. Not only are we in the image of God and supposed to reflect God to this world... But we're supposed to help populate this world with godliness. Increase. Say, well, uh, 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 I'm sterile. Or I can't have kids. Or I'm too old. No, you can increase and multiply God's presence in this world by reaching out to your neighbors and loving them to the Lord. There are lots of ways to multiply. 
without doing it genetically. Uh, have I told you if you bring someone next week they'll get their own Christmas gift and you can tell them for Christmas instead of buying them something you brought them to church. Just hawk it. I mean I, I want the I want yeah I want the turnout. I mean I bought a bunch of these for you guys and I don't want to have to send them back. It's kind of embarrassing. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him behold I'll establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that's with you for all future generations. I've set my bow. In the cloud it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth now this word bow cachet in the Hebrew this word bow is a reference to a bow boom like bow and arrow boom the, this is what a warrior or a hunter used it's a bow and so what he's saying is, I've set my bow in the heavens. And I love Nachmanides. Nachmanides was another medieval Jewish rabbi. The bow, when we see a rain bow, it's stringless and it's pointed away from earth. And we shouldn't lose that imagery. God takes the hunter's bow, he's finished the battle, he's finished his warrior, and he has hung his bow up, taken the string off, and just for safety measure shows you symbolically it's pointed away from earth. And that's some of the beauty of the bow that we now call a rain bow. Not bow in the sense of tie a bow on a package, but bow like bow and arrows. It's just one that comes out in the rain. God says, I'll remember. Now that Hebrew word remember, zakar, in the Hebrew. I didn't highlight it, but it's right here. Zakar doesn't mean, because I'm worried I might forget. You know, the rainbow is not God tying a string around his finger so that if it starts raining, he says, oh, I got to get that to stop before we flood the world. <clears throat> no. It just means um, I will act, I will act because of this covenant and commitment that is in my mind that I know. I'll remember my covenant between me and you and every living creature of all flesh that the waters will never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When that bow is in the clouds, I'm going to see it and I'm going to act on it. I'll remember the everlasting covenant between God and and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. This is the sign of the covenant I've established between me and all flesh. Do you see him saying it over and over and over again? He keeps driving home this point of this covenant because we should not miss it. Now all of that are the highs that we get after the flood. But everything is not a high. We've got some lows too. I want you to look at this with me. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Side note. Ham's the father of Canaan. Weird place to put a side note. But it's a side note that becomes pretty relevant in a little bit. So the sons of Noah are Shem, Ham and Japheth. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. That'll be the Tower of Babel story in a little bit. Noah began to be a man of the soil. He had been in construction work for the last hundred plus years. Then he was a, 
uh, in the maritime industry as a, a, a boatman. And now he decides, hey, I think I'll become a farmer. So Noah plants a vineyard. Noah makes some vino. Noah becomes drunk and lays in his tent with nothing on but the TV. He buck naked, as we would say in Lubbock. Noah does this. Now, first of all, let me just say something about biblical concerns consuming alcohol. Um, there, the Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with having socially using alcohol. Heavens, Jesus turned water into wine. Uh, and he did not put a sign on it that says, do not drink this. I mean, he, he did it to be used. But the Bible does warn us that alcohol is something that can be incredibly destructive. And it can be incredibly destructive to your health, but it also can influence your mind. And that's why you've got Proverbs like Proverbs 20 verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Now for some people, they are alcoholics. And by that I mean their brains cannot handle a drink of alcohol because it starts altering their brain chemistry in such ways that they can't stop and they can't control. In addition to that, there are just some people who just like to go get sodded. And then in addition to that, there are some people who are quite responsible but they find it uh, uh, easy to use. And then there's five of us that are teetotalers still in the world. Um, but only five. <laughs> it, 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 and and it, it is this process. But we're, we're, we always need to talk about this. Um, you know, my wife will have a social drink. I do not, I'm 63, I've never had a drop, unless you count NyQuil. Um, <laughs> b b or vanilla, you know, that goes in a cake or something. But, but. Uh, and we taught our children to be responsible in this stuff. Uh, uh, those of you who join me on that teetotaling side of the aisle, it's not our job to judge anybody else. But those of you on the social drinking aisle don't get to judge me. And I can tell you that alcohol can destroy people's lives if it's not used carefully and responsibly. And if you are hurting people, people you love and people you don't know or you are drinking your liver into destruction then you are not being the godly example you need to be so I just throw that out there for what it's worth all right Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his dad and told his two brothers outside then Shem and Japheth took a garment laid it on both their shoulders they walked backwards and they covered the nakedness of their dad their faces were turned backwards, but they didn't see their father's nakedness. When Noah awakes from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. Do you see how bizarre this is? Does this strike you as odd? Look at it. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his dad. Well, it's Noah's fault for lying there buck naked. Only if we're reading it in our mindset. This is that slide I've shown you every week, so I'm not going back to it right now. But that slide that says this is written to an ancient people in their language with their culture. So when you read this story, you say, 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 what? What's going on here? He saw the nakedness of the father, and it's that big of a deal. Genesis is the prequel. 
We can read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and get some sense of some of this language. This is what's called a euphemism. The Greek preface you means good. It's a good way to say something that's a little too risque to put into the Bible or to put into everyday language. It refers to a sexual violation. Let me give you another passage to get, put this into context. This is out of the law in Leviticus 20. If a man takes his sister or takes a daughter of his father or a daughter of his mother, so a half-sibling, and sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness, it's a disgrace. They're to be cut off in the sight of the children of the people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness and he shall bear his iniquity. It is a reference that also uncovered the nakedness. It is a reference to sexual relations between them. If someone sexually involves themselves with a sibling or half-sibling, they're to be cut off. And if, if she sees his, if she's involved in it too, they're both cut off. If it's him, he bears the iniquity. And so this passage is one that scholars debate the meaning of, but it seems most clearly I side with those many scholars who say this is the euphemism that Ham either castrated or sodomized his father. Now you know why the curse is there. And this is interesting too. He goes out and he tells it. Yagad in the Hebrew, actually Nagad is the, the, the true verb when it's not in that form. Nagad is, he goes out and he tells his brothers. That's not the general word, Amar, for, for talking about it and telling him. That's like bragging about it. He goes to his brothers, <laughs> guess what I did to dad? He's lying naked. I mean, this is very, very offensive what happened. So Shem and Japheth take a garment, they lay it on their shoulders, they walk backwards, they cover the nakedness, their faces are turned backward, but they didn't see their father's name. They didn't do anything about it. They didn't mess with him the way their brother had. So when Noah awakes and he knows what his youngest son has done, he curses Canaan, who's a son of Ham that did the, the bad deed. Which brings up the question, why Canaan? Why his grandson? There are lots of answers because we don't know. The Bible's not telling us the answer directly. Nachmanides, who was another uh, famous Jewish rabbi in the Middle Ages, Nachmanides said that Canaan was the oldest and only son. So when you cursed him, the curse was extra big. But if you read the text, it doesn't look like Canaan's necessarily the oldest or only son in that way. So I, I tend to write that one off. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said that you've got a problem because of the verse I told you to hang on to where God said that he had already blessed the sons of Noah and since God had already blessed them you can't take back that blessing from God so instead it went to Canaan there are other arguments as well um, no one knows is the bottom line. I, I, I can tell you more. Uh, uh, some say that this was a castration of Noah. Because Noah had three sons and Ham didn't want him to have any more. And so the principle would have been, hey, Adam got by fine with three sons. That's all dad needs. He doesn't need a fourth. And so if you read the context, Canaan, it does look like his fourth in the birth order. So the fourth son of Canaan bears the curse. We don't know. We don't know what. But the cor cor curse is important. Look at it carefully. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, one son. Let Canaan, grandson of Ham, 
be his servant, his slave. May God enlarge Japheth, the other of the three sons, and let him dwell in the tents of his brother Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Okay, don't lose this. This is critical. Let me throw it up on a map. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The table of nations will be laid out in Genesis chapter 10, and we know where they go. Shem become the people we would call Jews and Arabs today. So the Jews and Arabs come from Shem. The languages, Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, are called Semitic languages because the sum part is just that word Shem. Shemitic languages, Semitic languages. So that's where Shem is. If you continue to read, you'll see that Ham settles in Africa, settles up in Libya, settles over in Egypt, settles down in Ethiopia. This is Ham and the Hamitic people. Japheth becomes Europe and Asia and Russia and Gog and Magog and those types of places. Canaan, who is a son of Ham, dwells in the land of Canaan. So what the scripture says is that Shem, we'll read about him again, Shem is going to be blessed, I'll go back and show you again, Japheth will also dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan is going to be slave to Japheth and to Shem. Look back at the passage. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Blessed be Yahweh, Hashem, Adonai. That's the name of God. Blessed be Jehovah, the God of Shem. In other words, the presence of God himself is going to be with the, the Shemites, the Semitic peoples. And Canaan will be his servant. And then may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. This is just another prophecy that started back in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall. If you recall the fall, we're funneling down to God's solution to sin. And so the first is, it would be the offspring of Eve. And that's Genesis 3.15. From the seed of woman will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. Here's our next promise. It's going to be from the offspring of Shem. That's the people where the divine presence is going to be. It's not going to be Canaan. It's not going to be Ham. And it's not going to be Japheth. Jesus did not come from Europe. Semitic. Now, we're going to keep rolling, and we'll see later Abraham. We'll see the promise goes to Isaac. We'll see the promise goes to Jacob. We'll see the promise goes to Judah. We'll see the promise goes to David. And all of them, ultimately, Jesus is the answer. But if you look at Luke's genealogy of Jesus, he traces him back to Shem. Because that's the promise of the holy dwelling of God with people. Blessed be the Lord the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now this is interesting. To dwell in the tents of Shem, that doesn't mean you're moving. It doesn't mean people from Europe are going to move down and live in Saudi Arabia and that kind of stuff. To dwell in the tents in a Bedouin culture then meant to own an interest in, in a sense. If you went into a Bedouin's tent, they would give you what is theirs. You shared, in a sense, in the ownership of that tent. That's a very deep hospitality. So there's something about Japheth and the people uh, of, of Europe and Asia that will get to have a role, some type of ownership, if you will, with the promise that's coming through Shem. Now, at the time of Jesus and before, Jewish rabbis believed this passage was one of the reasons that they could translate the Bible into Greek. Because they're taking the Semitic and they're sharing it with the offspring of Japheth. 
who's supposed to get to dwell in the tents. They thought this was biblical authority for doing that. Um, if you want a passage for what this is like, uh, Psalm 84.10 is a good passage to give you this idea of what it means to dwell in the tents. That's the passage of a sense where the psalmist says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper at the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the unrighteous, than to have a share of unrighteousness. All right, let's keep going. So you've got Shem, Ham, Japheth, Canaan, and you've got this curse of slavery. Did you know that this passage was used in American history to justify slavery? Preachers preached sermons and people held debates and they said the African people were declared by God to be slaves of the Europeans and the Middle Easterners. So it is biblical to put them into slavery. Because they are the descendants of Ham. Well, aside from the fact that that's just atrocious, and aside from the fact that that is disgusting, it's also really bad theology. Because Ham's not the one who was cursed. The curse was on Canaan, not on Ham. It's got nothing to do with the Hamitic people. But I will go you a step further and tell you that it's very clear the gospel applies to all. Jesus comes and he speaks into this curse because he's the answer to the curse. If you haven't heard Pastor Jerry's sermon yet, it is phenomenal today. But he will talk about how Jesus, his wonderful counselor, is the answer to any problem we've got. Jesus answers not only our problems, he answers the curse. He is the solution to the curse. And so you can read in Acts chapter 8 where an Ethiopian eunuch is converted. What descendant? A descendant of Ham, an Ethiopian eunuch. Then you can read in Acts chapter 9 where Paul is converted. What race is Paul? Descendant of Shem. He's Jewish. And then you can read in Acts chapter 10 where Cornelius is converted. What race is Cornelius? Japheth. All three sons of Noah are reached by the gospel of Jesus. And it should not surprise us because Jesus said this would happen. In John 10, 16. It's a great passage. John 10, 16. Look what Jesus says. I have sheep, other sheep. That are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they'll listen to my voice. And there'll be one flock. One shepherd. This was not just a Jewish thing. And it's not just John 16, 10, 16. Matthew 15. Jesus reaches outside. And heals a Canaanite family. That's what we've got here. We've got this curse being undone. If you read Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you get the same idea. It comes out there as well. 1 verse 8. You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit's come upon you, you'll be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus comes and he is the answer to the curse of Canaan. And all of us get to share in it because we all come into the tent of the Semitic. And that's this disturbing, sad story with a promise that's beautiful. 
All right. Tower of Babel. We can do this in the 10 minutes, maybe. Tower of Babel is a great story. So let's get the story out there first. And I want to carefully consider all, uh, several key parts of this. But the, it's not a long story, so we got it. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Shinar is the ancient land of Sumer, where the Sumerians are from, where Babylonians will ultimately be from, uh, modern Iraq. They settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks. Bricks is this Hebrew word right here. Um, I want to write it down because I want you to remember this Hebrew word. It's going to become kind of important. But I'm going to write it instead of writing it. Uh, I'll, some of you do read Hebrew, so I'll give you the Hebrew so that you've got it in front of you. Um, so the Hebrew word for brick is, eh, do better. Hold on, we need a little automatic focus. All right, the Hebrew word for brick is the, the Hebrew letters, uh, lamed, bait, and I'm, uh, it's a noon suffet, but it's a, a, a noon. It, this is, in other words, L, B, N. And that's the Hebrew word for brick. Okay, got it? Becomes relevant. There'll be a quiz on this. And burn them thoroughly, and they had brick for stone. So if you go to that mud land in between the Tigris and Euphrates in the, this area, they don't have any stone. They can't build with stone. So what they would do is they would fire these bricks and use bitumen for the mortar, and they would make things out of brick. It's because, you know, in Egypt they got stones. They don't have stones there. This is what they could build with. So they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they're one people. They have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they'll do. And nothing they propose to do will be impossible for them. So let's go down there and confuse their language. This word confused, naval, in the Hebrew, I want to write it down. And I want you to see it too. I'm going to put it under brick. Under brick we have confuse. And confuse is naval. Those are the same letters, just they write it different if it's at the end of the word. So confuse is N B L. God says, they're making stuff with bricks. We're going to go there and unbrick them. We're going to de brickalize those people. Let's go down there and de-brick their language so they can't understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now let's talk about this story and let's put it into its cultural context for that era. Who knows anything about real estate? What are the three most important rules about real estate? <laughs> the same is true when they were building temples and towers to the gods. They thought the gods would give, a lot of times they do it by lot because they thought the gods were telling them where they wanted it built. The Tower of Babel was a ziggurat. And ziggurats were built as portals for the God. It wasn't for humans to get up to the gods. It was viewed as the way the gods would come down to the earth. And they'd put up at the top of the ziggurat like a little uh, welcoming gift. A little sofa, some food on the table to entice the God to come on down. Come on down, Bob Barker would be saying. 
and, and they came because in their minds the gods are up there and you and I know any time we leave a building we go out a door generally I mean a few of you may climb out windows but most of the time we go out the door and so they're looking for those doors where the gods will come down and so they're gonna build this because it's their way of saying we will control God we will entice him to come down and boy will we be famous for this talk about our name our reputation we got God down here side note that's the Greek letter Chi Chi is the way we say it in English I think ancient Greeks probably would have called it a he but Chi looks like an X in fact you can write it like an X so take that letter Chi and I want to tell you that some ancients wrote in kind of an X sish structure I'm going to explain what I mean in a moment but it's called chiastic or a chiasm it's writing in a special way let me see if I can illustrate it for you they would make a point we'll call it point A then they'd make another point we'll call it point B then they'll make another point we'll call it point C and if this is a chiasm it's going to be the same on the bottom that it is on the top so after they make their middle point they'll repeat point B and then they'll repeat point A and the reason they did this is to emphasize that point in the middle it's an ancient writing technique that's used in a number of places in the Bible but we don't really write that way today now some of you knowing that Valentine's Day is coming up in February are probably going to go home and write your sweet thing a chiastic poem and your sweet things not going to realize what artful thoughtfulness went into this from thousands of years ago and if you do secretly please give me a copy because I can't do that as talentedly as you can and I'd like to give it to Becky and claim I did it myself so um, this is an ancient artistic form of writing and it's present in this text let me show you how the text starts out and says there will be one language let me see how we're doing time wise yeah I don't have time to, to put the text up here you can go back and look one language people had one language they're in one location they're going to unite together to increase their reputation as they build the tower so that God will descend and be at their beck and call God comes down but not at their beck and call he comes down in judgment he comes down and examines what's going on God is not at their beck and call and instead now we're gonna back out of the chiasm instead of managing to be a united people who make a name for themselves they are a divided people and God does it because they've got an arrogant attitude and that becomes their reputation and then instead of being in one location they go to many locations and then instead of having one language they have many languages and the story is built that way because if we understand that we'll see the emphasis point that God is a judge who descends when and where he chooses they didn't need to finish that tower to entice God down if they thought they were building a portal for the gods they needed to learn that we don't command and we don't co coax God we don't need to be in the business of cutting deals with God now let me give you just a little dessert on this passage yes God appears as God chooses and we're gonna get that in the coming story because Jacob's gonna fall asleep at what becomes Bethel and he's gonna have a dream where the heavens open and a staircase descends and the angels are ascending and descending there God picks where God comes God picks when God comes people don't 
And Jesus will tell Nathaniel in the New Testament that that whole vision of the staircase with God and the angels ascending and descending is representative of him on the cross. The true bridge where God has entered this world and brought this world to him. I'll also tell you this. While God curses the people in Babylon and destroys them, as God sends his Holy Spirit, he reverses Babylon at Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit comes in and now everybody with all these different tongues can understand and hear. We get so wrapped up in trying to figure out what speaking in tongues is, we miss that what we're doing here is we're fixing the story of Babylon. We're bringing it to a, compl a Babel. We're bringing it to a completion. If we carefully consider this story, there's a lot to be had there. But let's get to the ideas for home. By the way, we've made it 97 slides so far. Pretty good. So ideas to take home. In other words, these are your points for home. Number one. Oh, this slide didn't work right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not going to do this. We've got an extra minute. Yeah, why isn't that working the way it should? It's right there. Okay, there. Number one, honor your father and your mother. Honor your family. Honor your obligations. Don't let your personal drives dictate how you live your life. Don't let your drive, well, I can't be helped. I just, that's the way God made me. No, that's blasphemy. If it's something bad, it's something God wants to grow you out of and make you something different. Don't blame your temper on God. Don't blame your sexual immorality on God. Don't blame your intemperance on God. It ain't God's doing it. It's us. And that's why we have commandments that come with things like a promise, as Paul says in Ephesians. Honor your father and your mother. Now, I'm looking out there. <clears throat> Some of you don't have moms and dads alive. Doesn't mean you can't still honor them. And you honor your mother and your father by the way you treat everybody. You say, well, yeah, but you don't know my dad abused me or my mom abused me. Okay. Honoring them does not mean subjecting yourself to abuse. It's okay to remove yourself from that situation. But within the framework of life, what does it mean to show honor? You need to figure that out. And it's easy for me to say because my mom and dad were wonderful. But, but, and, and I feel bad for people who had tough parents and tough upbringing. And so this isn't, uh, it doesn't matter, let them walk all over you and abuse you. But, but, it, but it is struggle with it and figure out within the framework of who you are and where you are in life, how God would have you show honor. Next. Um, God, God's not a genie. I mean, he's not like going to give you three wishes. I mean, I, I know the old joke. God finds a fella and loves that fella and says, you know, you've just been so exceptional, I'm going to grant you the one wish of your heart. Fella says, uh, I don't like to fly, and I get motion sick on boats, but I do fine in a car. I want to be able to go to Hawaii. Could you just build me a highway to Hawaii? And God said, do you have any clue what you're asking for? Do you know how much of the world's resources that would take? Do you understand even remotely? Da, 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 da. Guy says, okay, I'm sorry. God says, give me a better shot. Guy says, could I please understand the heart and mind of a, of a woman? And God said, how many lanes do you want on the highway? <laughs> that is funny because it's a joke, but God is not a genie. We don't tell God what we want. He's not the hotel concierge to get us tickets that are hard to get or a seat in a restaurant. He's not Santa Claus to bring us something on Christmas Day. When they say, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower and its top in the heavens so that God can come down. No. God will come down 
when and where he chooses and it's ultimately in Jesus Christ. Last point from the Tower of Babel, pride is not your friend. Come let us build ourselves a city and make a name for ourselves. Be careful. If you want to build yourself a city, if you want to take the bricks and make something special to make a name out of yourself, I promise you God can unbrick you in a heartbeat. And so there we have it. And those are our lessons from Noah and the flood. And um, we will end it, oh, with a cartoon and a blessing. Um, next week, we move into Abraham. Um, Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would continue your work in our lives. Instill in us a deep desire to know you better and to serve you more devotedly. Help us conquer those bad habits and bad attitudes and bad mindsets and, and bad tendencies that we all struggle with as you continue to purify us into who we can become. We pray these things in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.